In previous episodes, I've talked about a low carbon future involving electric vehicles and maybe heat pumps in our homes. But as with any difficult problem, there may be more than one way to see it. What if electrification for vehicles and for heat wasn't the whole story? What if there's a slightly different but still low carbon way to move stuff about and to heat properly? In episode 8, I'm going to look into the smallest and simplest element we know and how it may or may not be part of that solution. Concluding that, incredibly, Mr. Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, might be onto something. Episode 8 is hydrogen. And this is a little series about a low carbon lifestyle. Sometimes this whole sustainable living can feel well, well intimidating, whether it's thinking you need to buy an electric car or install solar panels on your roof. The majority of us can't do that overnight. We can't do that straight away. Or it looks like completely changing the way you live, living off the land or turning vegan overnight, both of which are fantastic things. But for this mini series, we're gonna talk through how each of us can lower our emissions in everyday life and what that might look like. Some of the issues we have, we, we still got to tackle in building a low carbon future include how we heat our homes and how we travel. In previous videos, I've talked about the good side of electric vehicles and the use of heat pumps, and, but hopefully I've also talked about how we can't put all our hope in either. There is possibly an alternative solution to both, both issues around transport and heating, and it comes in the form of the smallest element we know, hydrogen. So do you think Hydrogen is everywhere. It's in water, it's all over, it's part of rocket fuel. Don't think Hindenburg disaster or hydrogen bomb. That's not the kind of hydrogen we're talking about. But hydrogen is really simple. We can make it, we can transport it, and when we burn it, we simply create water. Can you get any cleaner? It's a fluid or a gas, just like what we're used to putting in our cars at petrol pumps and with our gas boilers. Simple. Why don't we just pump hydrogen in our natural gas network? Um, that's that simple. Why don't we stop burning methane and burn hydrogen instead? Well, actually, that is the plan. It's maybe 10 or 15 years away, but we're actually already trialing the use of hydrogen for heating in a gas grid where 20% of the gas is hydrogen. We're doing that in the UK. We're trialing it to heat the buildings on the campus at Keele University, and we're also trialing it in, the, in a project just near me at the road in Bladen in Gateshead. That project is called High Deploy, and in the short to medium term, things like High Deploy could help reduce all of our emissions in the natural gas grid, and the heating and our heating systems it could reduce them substantially. And if High Deploy can use zero emission hydrogen, more on that later, your heating system could have a step change in emissions overnight just by changing the content of the glass, the glass, the gas, slightly. That sounds really good to me. And then supplementing that, there are hydrogen-ready boilers, like the one my mate Tom at Worcester Bosch has developed. And then we've got hydrogen-ready hobs that could burn 100% hydrogen to cook our food. No methane at all, no emissions. And if you have one of those boilers, you just need a short visit from a gas engineer and you'd have a zero emission heating if you could supply it with hydrogen. We could have a completely hydrogen-powered network just change from natural gas like we did from Towns Gas and Nine Simples. Nine Simples. Nine Simples. Simple. Brilliant. That is it. Let's do it. And then can't we burn hydrogen in our cars instead of petrol and diesel as well? Well, yeah, kind of. We tend to use hydrogen in a fuel cell to generate um, to generate electricity in the car that we that would power an electric motor and give us great performance like we see in electric vehicles today but it gives us that performance with quicker refueling and longer range hydrogen vehicles fill up like a petrol equivalent and they have as longer range um, and they have less worries linked to electric vehicles brilliant this is it and even if electric vehicles might be the solution for smaller cars with short distances hydrogen may be part of the solution part of the mix whether it's hydrogen buses like these in Aberdeen, lorries like these by a company called Nikola, taking on Tesla, if you get that, that's great. Um, hydrogen ships, hydrogen trains, maybe even hydrogen planes. This is fantastic. Oh my goodness, this is it. Stop what you're doing briefly. Climate change is solved. 
the future is here and it's hydrogen. Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Hydrogen! So why have I been glad we're on about electric vehicles and air source heat pumps? What a waste of time. Well, to begin with, I'll calm down a little bit. Most of what I've just talked about for hydrogen is a long way off. And I'm actually not sure hydrogen is made out, is all it's made out to be. I'm actually quite worried about putting our eggs, even a few of them, in that basket. At the moment, the majority and over 95% of the hydrogen used in the UK is made, and this is my simplified explanation, but it's made by taking natural gas or methane, which is a hydrocarbon, as you'll know, going back to GCSE chemistry, thanks, Miss Tyra, and that's made up of hydrogen molecules and carbon molecules. And what we do is we break it down into pure hydrogen with the byproduct of carbon that is released to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So when we use hydrogen as a low carbon resource, we're actually emitting a similar amount of carbon dioxide, if not more, than if we just burnt methane in the first place. So this type of hydrogen is known as grey hydrogen, and as I say, this is, this is how the majority of hydrogen we use in the UK is made today. But the promise from the hydrogen industry, which actually, funnily enough, tends to be the oil and gas industry trying to find a future, but the promise is that one day, this CO2 from this process will be captured, stored, or used, and not released into the atmosphere. And at the moment, that process is fairly rare, but there are plans in place, for example, the H21 plans, to use the, the caverns of the North Sea, where we took the natural gas from, to store CO2 safely. I've got another friend, Alex, who's working, to, uh, working for BP to develop carbon capture and clean hydrogen in Teesside. And it's really exciting. And then maybe with that carbon capture, we could call hydrogen low carbon. And this is a process that we would call blue hydrogen. And it's reliant on that carbon capture and storage. Something that the government were really keen, um, were really keen on a few years back before pulling one billion pound funding from major competition. But they're talking about it again with some more or less ambitious funding. Think less one billion, think more 15 million. And then finally, there's green hydrogen, where we use renewable energy to power an electrolyzer to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. And this is a really low carbon process. And a little bit foolishly, this is how I assumed all hydrogen was made. But currently, there's really a very small amount of hydrogen made in this way. And at the moment, electrolyzers tend to be quite expensive. There are companies in the UK like ITM Power, trying to reduce the cost of electrolyzers and to promote the mass use of them. And this is a really good thing. There are also more experimental technologies that some of the research staff at Durham Uni, for example, uh, the School of Engineering, that they're looking into around hydrogen gasification, where you can make hydrogen from more or less any waste material. Gasification looks like it's got major potential, but it actually probably isn't that feasible, uh, particularly for generating hydrogen in the next five, 10 years. We're looking more like 15, 20 years. But however hydrogen is made, we need to make sure it's made without more CO2 emissions. So, okay, let's dream with me a moment. Eventually, we've got a clean, low carbon fuel that we can power our transport with and we can heat our homes with. Surely this is the horse we should be backing and I'm getting excited again. Here we go. Here's to you, little hydrogen. Jesus loves you more than you could know. Whoa. Uh -oh. And the solutions linked to hydrogen, whether that's hydrogen ready boilers or fuel cells in cars or other transport, have that direct competitor in the form of heat pumps and battery electric vehicles. And as I mentioned in episode seven, this to me appears to be a technology war, a bit like the VHS, Betamax, HD, DVD, V, Blu-ray, Laserdisc versus... Will, will Laserdisc compete with anything? I'm not really sure. Maybe they would. Laserdiscs? And where I sit at the moment, it, it looks like the electric version of this competition today is winning. Um, EVs are thriving. Heat pumps aren't doing too well, but they probably have a 10 to 15 year head start on a fully functional hydrogen network. And we could install loads of heat pumps tomorrow. Production of hydrogen has its problems with how much carbon it takes or because it's using power to create a fuel, using that power in the process due to inefficiencies so we can transport that fuel for power elsewhere. It's a bit convoluted. 
other major problems with the, the infrastructure changes required to improve our gas network so that hydrogen in our pipes, gas pipes, doesn't leak. It's, it's a really small molecule. And then there are upgrades to our hob and our boiler burners so they can burn hydrogen in the first place. On top of that, then there's the price of hydrogen. So if we take a cheap fuel like natural gas, which is very cheap at the moment, push it through an extensive process processing with, with complex and unproven carbon capture in order to supply it through our gas networks as a fuel, I think we really risk making low, the low carbon future that we hope for more expensive than our high carbon present. For me, hydrogen probably has some role to play in a zero carbon future. Maybe for powering large transport like trains or lorries. Maybe for heating our leakiest buildings that we can't or don't want to retrofit too much. Or for storing energy when we generate too much from renewables. But I don't think it's the solution to pin all our hopes on. It seems a decade or so away. And if I'm honest, I've got worries about the role of the oil and gas industry in all this. I've got worries about the costs. And actually, I see an alternative solution. Yeah, with its own problems, but an alternative solution in electric heating and electric transport. This is really complex. It's a challenge. Will there be a winner or will there be some kind of mix? I encourage you to come back in a decade and Low Carbon Lifestyle episode 189 to find out. We'll still be here. So, simple question. Should you buy a hydrogen car or get a hydrogen ready boiler? Well, you can't do either yet. You kind of can get a car, but you can't really fill it anywhere. Um, but I'm going to come to the same conclusion of most episodes I've done so far in here, that we need to use less energy. We need to improve efficiency and reduce our consumption. And when it comes to hydrogen, this probably means turning to your homes, um, the home's insulation, the fabric, the thermostat first, and then waiting a few months or years for air or sleep pumps or hydrogen ready boiler to become more affordable. And actually, as you may have seen in the last couple of weeks, there's been a big announcement from the government about a building energy efficiency scheme. Mr. Sunak has given us some money to do up our homes. From September, homeowners and landlords will be able to apply for vouchers to make their homes more energy efficient and create local jobs. And I'd really recommend looking into this and trying to apply for a grant for your own home. We don't need to get confused about a technology that is unproven at the moment or might be proven in the next few years. We really need to work hard today to reduce our own emissions. Okay, that's all I have for episode eight. Thanks so much for again for watching. I really appreciate so many of you engaging with this. If you want to stay in touch, um, please like this video and subscribe to this channel. Um, sign up to the mailing list that we link below. And even better, follow me on Twitter and engage with me on there. So in the next episode of Low Carbon Lifestyle, I'm going to have a look about sustainable fashion. And unbelievably, I don't think they're on my case yet, but the fashion police are going to let me get away with one. Um, so yeah, tune in next time to have a little think about where we get our clothes from and where we spend our money and whether we can make some more sustainable choices for that. Jesus loves you more than you could know. Uh, uh, uh.